Thank you for listening to the Sharon Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about the church, please visit us at SharonChurch.com. Now we hope you learn from and enjoy today's message. If you will, go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to continue our study this morning through Jesus' epic Sermon on the Mount. He calls it the good news of the kingdom. He preached it in 15 minutes. We're studying it for four and a half months. Because that's just what we do, apparently. It's what we do. So in Matthew chapter 6, I want to get us there. I want to read through this entire passage. You've heard it. I think you know it. I think it's something you're probably going to uh, hear some words that will trigger some memories for you. We're going to study that together. I'm going to read through it. And then uh, I want to put this all in context with Out of context, it can mean something, but doesn't mean the thing. So I want to make sure that we put all this in context this morning. On the screen are some scriptures I'm going to use this morning. We're going to do the chunk in Matthew. I'm going to reference a few places so you see this thought is not just uh, it's not just locked into right here. This is a a whole biblical idea this morning. So let's read this passage. I'll read it out loud. It'll be on the screen. Follow along in your device or your uh, your Bible this morning. Matthew chapter six, verse nineteen. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Some of your translations there say mammon, which is an Aramaic word. I'm going to use that word throughout the rest of the morning because I think it's actually truer to what's being said. Verse 25, there's three therefores. Here's the first one. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the heathens, the pagans seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Instead, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore... Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Father, we need you and your spirit to teach us this morning. Without that, we make a mess of your word. We make a mess of scripture. So God, we need your help today to know your intent behind these holy and sacred words. So God, give us ears to hear you. Give us eyes to see you. Give us a heart that's soft and tender to sense your presence, to sense where you're leading us through conviction or comfort this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. How many of you are gift card people? You like getting gift cards uh, as a gift. Anybody raise your hand? You like getting gift cards? Put your hands up high. Be proud of it. Let us all know what to get you. Okay, gift card people. How many of you do not like gift cards? You think it's rude and and insensitive? (laughs) All right. Uh, My mom is just like you. Uh, I remember growing up, I'm the oldest of six, and and to this day, I have the hardest time telling anybody what I want for my birthday or Christmas. I'd like to tell you it's because I'm so humble, and I'd rather give than receive. It's honestly because there's so many choices, I want to make sure you get me the right thing. And so I just don't know, and so I remember being early teenager uh, at Christmas, and um, just told my mom, I think I just want cash. And she looked at me like I was straight from the pit of hell, and she was like, you What? Because for my mom, it's like, how do you not want the thing that I want to get you? Why do you not want that? Why do you not want the thing that I want to be able to get to give to you? Why do you want what you want? I'm like, I think that's the whole point of gifts, mom. I don't know how to explain this to you, but um, that's where I land. And now as a parent, I think I understand the issue. 
Because to give our seven-year-old daughter a gift card is a gift to her, and it's punishment for the rest of us. That's what that is. Because a Target gift card, God forbid, a Claire's gift card to our seven-year-old daughter is half a day in purgatory for me. That's what that is. It's, I mean, it's 12 to 18 hours of just, do I want this? Do I want this? Do I want this? I don't care. I really don't care. I, whatever you want, girl, whatever you want from here, it's going to be thrown away in a week. I don't really care what happens. But there's this moment for her where she's like, I get, I get to pick whatever I want. I have all these endless options. And then she stands before the toy aisle at Target or uh, the jewelry aisle at Claire's, and she's like, look at all of this. This could all be mine, except I only have $15 on my gift card, and now I have to choose. And the choosing is the worst part. That's the worst part. Because whether she went in there with an idea of what she was going to get, this is what I want. Then she saw everything else she didn't know she wanted, and now she knows she wants that instead. That's where, the par- that's where everybody gets paralyzed. We just stand right there. And we're like, you, you're the queen of this world now. You figure it out. I'll fast for an hour without you figuring this out. So sometimes for us, we think that choices bring freedom. But if we're honest, choices actually imprison us. We think that if we could stand before the world with this plethora of options, it would just be amazing. And if we just had enough money to actually choose what we were going to eat, how amazing that would be. We had enough money to actually get the house we wanted, not the one that we could afford. If we actually had that much money, how amazing this would be. If I, if I had all the time in the world, how many times have you said, if I just had a few more hours today? We think that if we just had more, it would give us more options. That would set us free. The truth is, options don't bring us freedom, and we know it. A number of years ago, Meredith and I got to spend some time in Kenya. And while in Kenya, we... Um, met a bunch of just Kenyan families. We were working for a missions organization. Long story short, uh, we were to bring uh, these Kenyan children back to the States, and we would do uh, an African children's choir tour. We would, we would lead these children in, in a tour. Um, I would not do any of the choir part because we want people to give money to it, and so I wouldn't do any of that, uh, but we were leading these interns. We'd meet these families, and one of the rules that we were told about bringing them back to the States was whenever they're in host homes, y'all let host homes know, do not give these kids options. And not because they're spoiled and would just choose the most expensive thing, but because literally they would not know what to do with options. And it would be cruel to them to give them options. And in America, we're like, cruel? I think the best thing is options. But it'd be cruel. And how many of those kids, while they're in the States, long for the simplicity of being back home, where there really are no options? What you do is what you do. What you eat is what's ever in front of you. What you do that day, you go outside and you play. That's what you do. And so as we study this morning, I want us to keep in mind that I think we've bought into the lie uh, that options bring freedom. The truth is they enslave us. They paralyze us. We're going to study that here this morning in Matthew chapter 6. Let's go back into the, into the, to the scriptures. I'm going to look verse by verse at it and just, let's just see what God has for us. Again, I want to put it in context, both in biblical context and in this actual immediate context of what's happening here. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 This is Jesus continuing. He's in the middle of this epic sermon, the good news of the kingdom. Do not lay up for yourselves or store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Instead, verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So let's give us some context. Jesus is beginning his earthly ministry. He's called a few people to follow him. And the word's gotten out that he's healing people. And then he's feeding people. It's just amazing what's happening. So people are now drawn to him. But not the dockers and polo shirt people. I mean, the people who are just grungy and grimy, the ones who shop at Hot Topic. They're the ones now that are following Jesus. And they're on the edges and the outskirts of society. They've been pushed there mostly by religious leaders. So they've been drawn in to follow Jesus because this just sounds different. At the end of the sermon, we we read that they were amazed at the authority that he spoke with. So they're following him, but he's made a declaration that the kingdom of heaven is here. That what you were once following in the kingdom of the world is now pushed aside because there's a new king in town and he's brought his kingdom with him. So now there's a kingdom of heaven. And what he's laying before the people in this sermon is there's only two options. You serve the kingdom of this world or you serve the kingdom of heaven. And there's no in between. There's no mingling of them. There's no ways that they overlap. This is the choice for you. 
So he lays out these two options. He begins to describe what it looks like to be people, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Talks about being uh, poor in spirit and mourning our sin and hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We call those the Beatitudes. Then he transitions into this idea that uh, you've heard it said of old, but you've missed it. You've lived by the letter of the law. I'm telling you, I'm after your hearts now. Let's get our hearts in the kingdom of heaven. It's all about our hearts and our actions follow our hearts. And then he, sh- he shifted. Last week, we looked at these three practices he gives to people who are, in the citiz- who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven of how you give, how you pray, and how you fast. And throughout all of that, if you're paying attention, he's only given two options. And he's going to shift here in Matthew 6. And you're going to see this if you pay attention for the rest of the sermon, the rest of this epic sermon on the mount that Jesus is going to co- compare and contrast the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. And it begins to take off here. And here's what he says. There's two options. You're either storing treasures on earth or you're storing treasures in heaven. In the previous few verses in chapter 6, he looked at it. And here's what he said to us. And if you're paying attention, here's what he said. How do you store up treasures on earth? Well, you crave the affirmation of man. That's how you store up treasures on earth. That you, you crave the world's affirmation. And Jesus had said blatantly in chapter 6, the first 18 verses, if you do that, you'll get it. If you live your life based on pleasing people, earning uh, their respect, gaining a reputation, trying to please yourself in the way the world pleases themselves, you'll, you'll be fine. You'll find that there, but at the expense of God, and you'll lose the reward of heaven. However, if you seek God, if you're going after him, you will find him there. So now he continues that thought. So now when he's speaking of laying up treasures, this is what he's speaking of. The treasure of earth versus the treasure of heaven. And then verse 21, he drops this line and says, because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where we search for fulfillment, contentment, or treasure is where we will find our heart. It's what's drawing our heart. You'll find it there. You can look at your calendar and your checkbook, and it will tell you where your heart actually lies. Not what you tell people, but where your heart actually lies. What do you spend your time and your money on? That's what you desire. Sure, you can tell me all day long you desire something, but we'll find evidence of it in how you spend your time and in how you spend your money. And he continues, and this feels out of place because we don't understand the context, but here's verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, how many of you um, are my glasses and contacts people? Raise your hand. You wear glasses and contacts? Yes. Good. You're going to understand this a lot more than these 2020 people will. Like, they don't get the struggle. They don't understand. They don't. They just don't get it. So this is what he's speaking of. Speaking of eyes, he's going to speak of vision and how it relates now to treasure. Because he says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. So now he's shifting. You go after the things that you see. So now he's comparing two different things. In a Jewish thought, a good eye was a generous eye. That's, that's great. That's kind of the idea. But in context, you need to understand a few things. This, these are medical terms that are being said here. If your eye is healthy, so the word healthy here, that my translation, some of yours says good or single. That's the idea, is to be single. But medically, it means unfolded. There is a condition, I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but there is a condition in which the top layer of your eye literally begins to fold in and on itself. It starts at the edges and works its way towards the middle. It literally folds on itself. And as it folds, it creates double vision. It creates where you're looking through a kaleidoscope. That's the idea. When everything folds in on itself, and it's a condition that would have happened. And so it's a medical term, which means when everything is good, when it's healthy, it's unfolded, single vision. But when the eye is bad, it is folded or it is divided. It creates a double vision. The, the actual word means that it's been pressed by labors that by working so hard to correct it, it actually makes it worse inside of your eye. So a good eye is unfolded. It has single vision. A bad eye, an unhealthy eye, actually has double vision. So the point Jesus is making is if your eye is single, if it's unfolded, your body is full of light. You let all the light in. But if your eye is folded in your double vision, your whole body is full of darkness. 
And if what is supposed to be light is actually dark, it makes the darkness even darker. That's the point he's making. So my contact people, yesterday I'm coaching soccer out on these fields back here. And in between uh, game two and three, there's something flies into my left eye. Don't know what it is. Something hits me in the left eye. Could be dust, could be pollen. I don't know what it is. But it's one of those feelings that the only words that come to your mind are things you can't say from a stage in a church. Those are the words that come into your heart and your mind. It's just excruciatingly painful. And you think, if I, I can blink it out, I can, get, I can rinse it out, nothing happens. And then my contact falls out. It just falls out of my eye. I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to put that back in. So that's there. Um, but it all happens at the worst time. I'm talking to a parent while it happens. And I don't know if you're like this, but when my eyes hurt, my face makes you feel like I hate you. Like that's what happens. I get all scrunched up. Like I start foaming at the mouth. My eyes water. And so I have to explain to this dad. He's like, is my kid that bad? And I'm like, no, it's me. Like it's, it's all me. This really hurts. So when you have eye problems, you understand like it affects you. Like you're miserable. This is what Jesus is saying. If we have the wrong vision, it affects more than just what we're seeing. It affects everything else about us. And so one good way to study theology is, is to study what's called first mention. Where is this idea first mentioned in Scripture? And so I know you're tired of it. We're going to go back to Genesis because I think that's where a lot of things are first mentioned. We're going to see this happen. So I want you to pay attention in this account of where the Scriptures speak of eyes and sight. It's important for us. Genesis 1 and 2, God has created the world. Everything is as it should be. It's perfect. It's whole. It's complete. He's placed man and woman in the garden, and he's told them, everything here is yours. Every tree that's good for food, it's all yours. Everything. All the onyx stone and the crystal and the gold, it's yours. These rivers that run through it, it's all yours. The animals are yours. It's all yours. Here's one thing I ask. Do not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you do, you will surely die. So that's where we pick up. God has been generous to his people, generous to man and woman, and he places them there. And here's verse 1 of Genesis 3. But there's a serpent that was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. How did the serpent get there? It's a whole other sermon series we don't have time for. Just know that he's there and he's a talking snake. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Here's what the enemy, here's what the Satan always does to us. He never invents his own words. He just twists the words of God to make us think things that aren't true. So the phrase, did he actually say, now it's planted in Eve's mind, I don't know. So here's her response. And the woman said of the serpent, no, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst or the middle of the garden, then she adds, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So she tries to counteract the lie of the enemy by adding more legalism to the Scripture than what's already there. And now she's going to find herself in a back and forth with an enemy that she will never overcome. And the serpent says to her in verse 4, you won't surely die. But here's the issue, he says in verse 5. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here's what this serpent is saying to Eve. You understand God's holding out on you. That's the problem. The issue is that he's holding something back that's rightfully yours because he wants to maintain superiority in your life. He understands that if you do this, you'll just be like him, and then he no longer has power. That, that's what's happening. So he plants this thought. Then look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes. And the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So now she shifted from the single focus of this beautiful garden where everything in it is hers and her husband's. And now with one subtle lie of the enemy, she's moved from an unfolded eye to a folded eye. And now she's questioning the goodness of God. And because of that distortion, the tree she once saw as God protecting her from, she now sees as God holding out from her, and now she's going to go after it. I'm going for it. And she eats. And then verse 7, the eyes of both were opened. Saw they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together. So in the context of Matthew chapter 6, the good eye sees the blessings that God has given. The good eye sees the garden. 
The good eye is blown away by the wealth of resources the Lord has given, but the bad eye sees the limitations that God has given and desires to be set free from it. In seeing the world through the generous goodness of God, our eyes are healthy and our bodies are full of light. When we see the world through what we would call restriction of God, then we become envious and jealous. So Jesus continues. Again, this is the flow of his sermon. These aren't separate little sound bites. This is flowing into something. So then verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or God and mammon. Do you see it? Jesus is saying, if your eye is folded and you're seeing double, you're going to try to go after both of them, and you can't. It doesn't work that way. You can't serve both of them. There's only one. For Jesus, this statement is a conclusion statement. This is the point he's making. Now, he'll give to us three therefores after that. Here's how it applies. Here's what we do with it. But this is the central statement of this passage. You cannot serve God and mammon. So let me define for us what mammon is. Some of your scriptures say the word mammon. It's an Aramaic word. And here's the definition. It is the pursuit of worldly things and pleasures. It is anything we put our trust in. We're going to sum it up with the word comfort. You cannot serve both God and comfort. Now, it's not to say you can't be comfortable and serve God. What it is to say is you can't serve, go after both of them. That's double vision. Those things that we put our trust in, the things that we put our trust in, Jesus is saying, they run against the agenda that God has for us. Peter Kreeft is an author who, a number of years ago, wrote a book on this topic of mammon, and here's what he says in it. He says, it is natural to man to desire external things as means, means to an end, but mammon makes them into ends or into gods. And when a creature is made into a god, it becomes a devil. It's natural for man to desire these things, to desire uh, comfort and satisfaction. It's, It's okay. That's what man desires, as long as it's a means to an end, a means by which to glorify God and, and do good to others. The problem happens when that becomes the end. And so now we're leveraging the things of God for the comforts of man. The temptation for us as humans is to serve multiple gods at once. The truth is we want to serve Jesus with a little bit of mammon mixed in. Yeah, I, I believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, And I also believe I should have a lake house. I believe both of those things together. I believe uh, that Jesus uh, demands my worship, that I give him glory. And also, I believe I should be comfortable. Sure, we say we worship Jesus, but the truth is we're trying to worship both of them at once. I I want all the things that I want and all the things uh, that God is asking of me. We cannot do it. And Jesus is saying it is impossible to do it. You can't. It is simply impossible. More on that later. Now he gives us the first therefore in verse 25. Whenever you see the word therefore, you've got to ask yourself the question. What's it there for? Well, Jesus just told us what it's there for. You can't serve God and mammon. Therefore, don't even try. Do not be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about mammon, about what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Because we'll never be able to serve two masters, Jesus says. Don't be anxious about it. Don't be anxious. Now, it's going to help us to define what anxious means because in our world, anxious has become, it's, it's been defined as a number of things now. And I think clinically there's anxiety, it's chemical imbalances, all of those things. But I would argue that most of what we call anxiety is actually our own doing. I think sometimes you need medicine to to settle that in, to be able to hear truth, absolutely. And for those of you who struggle with that, God bless you, and we pray for you. But I think for the majority of us, we like having an excuse, so we call it anxiety. The truth is we've made a mess of our lives. And so this word anxious in the Greek is the word merimnao, but the root word of where we get the the word merimnao is meritso. And meritso means to divide into parts, to separate into parts. And those of you who would call yourself anxious, is this not how you see your life? You don't see it as one single focus, one single goal, one single objective. 
that objective becomes overwhelming when you see the number of steps underneath that objective to obtain that objective. So students, you have the SAT on a Saturday, and for those of you um, who don't care about it, you're not anxious. But for the 3% of you who do care about it, you are like, you begin to separate all of the parts out. I need to get this score to get into this college and this score to get into this college. And then I haven't taken this class. I need to take this class. Some of you this week, you have a meeting at work and you're anxious about it. But you're not anxious about the meeting. You're anxious about all the parts that go into that meeting and about the emotions around it and the reason for it. Do you know the reason for it? Did your boss just say, hey, we need to talk on Monday? That's usually not good. And so now you're processing through all of that. This biblically, the idea of anxiety is when everything is separated into different parts. It comes from trying to serve more than one master. So for many of us, our anxiety is simply because you're not actually trying to serve God and God alone. You're trying to serve God and mammon. And therefore, we're anxious because every master has his own list of demands and they're often competing with one another. Those of you who played high school sports, you understand this because you had teachers who wanted one thing from you and coaches who wanted a completely different thing from you. And the teachers despised the coaches and the coaches despised the teachers. Do you remember this feeling? Because your teacher loves you and your teacher wants you to pass these classes because your teacher wants you to learn these things to be a good human. Your coach wants you to pass those classes so you can play quarterback on Friday. That's why. And so your coach will do whatever it takes. I'm sorry if this is, this is probably way too stereotypical. So if you're a coach, I love you. You're not all like this. But many are like, hey, how do we get you to pass that class so you can play on Friday? And the teacher's like, how do I get you to pass the class? How about you study? How about you do that? How about I don't care if you play Friday? And your dad's like, teachers are the worst. Your mom's like, man, I love that teacher. Okay. All of that's happening. Those of you who grew up in homes where you were disciplined differently by each parent, you understand exactly what this is. You can never please both of them. This is what Jesus is saying. You can't please both masters. And when you do, you become anxious. When you try to please both of these with competing agendas, it never actually works. So Jesus gives evidence. Here's how, here's how I know. Here's how I know you actually just need to please the one. He says, look at the birds of the air. And I don't know if I'm just getting old, but man, I, just, I love right now looking at birds of the air. Do you guys like that? Like in my backyard, I like to watch birds. So, you know, I'll eat dinner tonight at four o'clock. If you want to come over, we can have our dinner together. You'll get that later. Um, <laughs> look at the birds of the air, he says. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, by dividing things into parts, can add a single hour to his span of life? And then why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies, these flowers of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So Jesus says, you want to know how I know you can trust God? Look at these things who do nothing. They're not anxious. God literally provides food for the birds. And birds can't kill anything. He says, look at these flowers. They're not doing anything, and they're beautiful. So then Jesus stacks another therefore on top of the first therefore. Therefore, do not be anxious. Don't divide into parts, saying a number of questions. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? And he's listing these to kind of feed into the idea of these lists of separating things into parts. For the Gentiles, the worldly ones, seek after all these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And we just read it in, our, in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. He knows before you knew. But then verse 22, instead, here's the other option. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Jesus says, instead of worrying about mammon, instead of worrying about comfort or whatever we're trusting in for satisfaction, instead of worrying about making that travel ball team, instead of worrying about a raise, instead of worrying about that new house or the renovation, he says, just fix your eyes on me. This idea of seeking takes us back to the good eye. Have your vision set. It's active. Seek, pursue first. Now, this is not about priority. This is not saying seek the kingdom of God first thing in the morning and then seek mammon the rest of the day. That's not what it's saying. 
It's not saying, hey, seek the kingdom of God with your first 30 minutes of your devotional time in the morning and then the rest 23 and a half hours of your day, go after whatever the world has for you. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, hey, give your first 10% to God and then give 90% to whatever the world wants you to give it to. This is not about priority. This is about a filter or a lens. I'm gonna speak again to my contact glasses people. I know, like I know that I am not supposed to sleep with my contacts in. I know the doctor says that. The dentist also tells me to floss. And so, you know, you do what you want. And so I know that I'm not supposed to. It's going to mess up my eyes. And so sometimes I try not to when I'm being a responsible adult. Um, But here's my problem. If I'm not wearing my contacts and in the middle of the night I am awakened to something, I am of no use to my family whatsoever. (laughs) I couldn't defend a soul without my contacts in. And without my contacts in, I begin to see things in my house that aren't actually in my house. Anybody relate to that? (laughs) Without my contacts in and a dimly lit room, I'm ready to fight everything in there, man. (laughs) For the honor of my wife, I will attack that chair with my jacket on it. You better believe it because that thing's coming for my wife and I'm going to handle it. So the issue, what he's saying is, First thing in the morning, I have to put my glasses on or put my contacts in. Otherwise, I can't see. But to misinterpret this would be for me to put my glasses on and then shoot the jacket on the chair. Well, I did it, right? I sought first what I could see, and now I'm going to handle the rest of the world. No, the issue is when I put my glasses on, I actually see things the way they're meant to be seen. And so the issue with the jacket on the chair is not that it's coming after my wife. I better hang that thing up before my wife comes after me. That's that's the issue. So to seek first the kingdom of God is not that, well, I do that first so then I can go out and get the world. What it is, you put those glasses on first and you see everything completely differently. When you're seeking first the kingdom of God, when that's the lens by which you see the world, It changes the way you view your career, changes the way you view your spouse, changes the way you view your kids and your school and your teacher and your football team and your volleyball team and your cheerleading squad. It changes everything. It doesn't mean, hey, put your Sunday in and then go seek the mammon Monday through Saturday. It means, hey, put your Sunday in that it might affect the way you live your Monday through Saturday. That's the issue. So Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And then the final, therefore, in verse 34, therefore, he stacks this on top. Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, which is, I think, supposed to be comforting. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So because you'll never be able to serve two masters, because you find all you need when you seek the kingdom of God, don't divide your attention away from today and project it onto tomorrow. Here's what happens in our anxiety and anxiousness. Here's what we do. We borrow from tomorrow to make decisions about today. So we look to the future in order to shape the future and decisions we make today. And it happened for all of us. Growing up, you grew up in youth group, and you you had to think through what you wanted to be, like what your major was going to be. At 17 years old, I have no idea who I am. I don't know. I just know I want to be rich. So whatever major gets me that, that's what I want to do. So the issue, though, in following Jesus is not that. What he's saying is, listen, you don't project onto tomorrow today's issues, and you can't project tomorrow's issues onto today. You deal with today. And how do you deal with today? You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because if you do that today, you will find yourself in the kingdom of God and his righteousness tomorrow. It's simple. It's a series of right decisions about the kingdom of God, one on top of the other. But again, this whole section is built on this one statement in verse 24. So let's go back there to Matthew 6, 24. We're going to land here. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You either hate one, love the other, be devoted to one, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, if you've been in church for a long time, we breeze right through. Yeah, I get it. I I shouldn't serve two masters. But this context of the Sermon on the Mount reminds us you've only got two options. Your options are the kingdom of God or mammon. Those are the options. And you can't mix them. There's no third option here. We either belong to one or the other. We're pursuing one or the other. Douglas Jones is an author. In his book on a similar thing, he makes this statement. 
that Jesus understood the antithesis or contrast between God's way and mammon's way. He understood it as the most fundamental distinction in all of life and history. When Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God and mammon, he understands this is where the lines are drawn. He didn't divide the world into left versus right or liberal versus conservative or the envious versus the entrepreneur or even Christian versus Muslim. Jesus didn't make mammon just a side temptation for a few like we do. The point Douglas Jones is making is this is the central war for our souls. This is it. How we distinguish ourselves as followers of Jesus or followers, followers of the world all has to do with how we handle mammon. How do we handle it? And the question is, well, why is Jesus so profoundly against mammon? Why, what's the issue here? Like, why this? Because if I think through our world right now, I could give a list of things that I think are more dangerous than what he's considering mammon. I could, I could give you a list, and you know them. Like, you know what you would say. But biblically, this echoes throughout the whole of Scripture. Matthew chapter 13, we'll read it in a, in a few months. Jesus gives a parable of the sower where seed is scattered on different kinds of ground. And depending on the ground on which the seed landed tells us whether or not that seed is going to take root. And in Matthew 13, 22, he says, As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one he describes the parable, as the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Mammon choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Why is Jesus so passionate about mammon? Because mammon chokes the word of God. And it proves Christians to be unfruitful. When we shift our allegiance from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of mammon, we are unfruitful. And it chokes out the word. As a pastor and a teaching pastor in 2023, if I was pursuing mammon, I would not be teaching the way and the things that I teach on a Sunday morning. If my pursuit was that people would affirm me and we would grow in massive numbers, I know how to do that, to say things that you like and that the world would like and we draw them in. That's the pursuit of mammon. The problem is that chokes out the word and we are worthless. But the pursuit of God, of the kingdom of God, requires us to go against that. For you, in your own life, you've experienced this. The moment the gospel is shared with you or a, a message that brings conviction to you, mammon all of a sudden creeps right back in. Because some of you had that moment on a Sunday morning, you're convicted to do something and you leave this place and you get a call or a text from your job about something that's at stake for you and you abandon everything that God had for you to seek mammon. It could be an issue with your marriage or your parenting or school system, whatever it is. So why is Jesus so passionate about it? Because it chokes out the word of God. It makes it worthless. There's no point in coming here on a Sunday morning to study the word of God only to leave here and go pursue mammon. It's worthless. It's like eating Oreos while you're on a treadmill. There's no point. And Paul echoes this in his letter to a young preacher boy named Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 about some warnings. And he says in verse 6 of chapter 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world and we, can take any, we can't take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, mammon, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, mammon, is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Why is Jesus so passionate about mammon? Because it costs his people their faith chokes out the word of God and it leads them away from the faith. Sure, we can talk about societal issues all we want to. But at the end of the day, if we're going to fight that and not mammon, we're going to find ourselves seeking mammon anyway. Mammon is the very thing that took down Adam and Eve. It's the core of every one of our sins. That's why. Because our temptation is to serve multiple gods at once. Here's how we get around it, good Southern Christian people is that we worship the Lord on Sundays and then we spend the rest of our week on mammon. This is how we do it. 
High school is just how you do it. You show up at youth group, and you show up on Sunday mornings, and you go to small group, and you talk the talk. And then Monday through Friday at school, and then Saturday at the party, you're seeking mammon. And it's worthless. It means nothing. We want to have options. And so seeking mammon is the way that we keep our options open. Because if this God thing doesn't work out, at least I have this to fall back on. This is precisely what Jesus is telling us is impossible to do. We want to believe we can serve Jesus and wealth, Jesus and success, Jesus and comfort, Jesus and travel ball, Jesus and a lake house, Jesus and a pretty weekend on the boat. We want to believe we can do them both. And Jesus is saying, no, you can't. You're either all in with the kingdom of God or you're completely out. Those are your options. We think we can serve Jesus and whatever the world is telling us we need. And parents, we think we can serve Jesus and whatever the world is telling us our kids need. I think Jesus has already told us what our kids need. Let's just do that. Let's do that. Problem is we know it because we're anxious. We know it because we're depressed and lonely and distracted. We just don't want to admit it. Because goodness, we like the mammon. We've chosen material comfort over spiritual discomfort, and it shows. Our hearts follow what we treasure. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is your heart here today? Or is your heart somewhere else this morning? Is your heart on the plans for the afternoon? Is your heart on what you're doing this evening? Is your heart on what's coming this week? Is your heart on a meeting you have on Wednesday? Our hearts follow what we treasure. So what do we do? Well, in Romans 12, Paul tells us what to do. He tells us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. It begins with our mindset. How do we see it? How do we think about it? And for many of us, we think about mammon uh, like we think about a little pet. Sure, it poops in our house all the time, but it's a pet that we play with and hold on to. So mammon's like that. Yeah, it causes problems from time to time, but it's really cute. And I like it, and the kids love it. I mean, I can't go away on vacation or without somebody coming to let the dog out, or if I take the dog with me, I've got to pay more for a hotel that allows pets. But other than that, man, it's cute, so we keep it. That's what mammon is for us, just a little pet that we keep around. We've got to change our mindset on it. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, says, we, must, we really must understand that the lust for affluence in contemporary society is psychotic, which begs the question, Richard, how do, how do you feel about the lust for affluence, Really? He said it's psychotic because it has completely lost touch with reality. What is psychosis? It's anything that loses touch with, with reality. We crave things we neither need nor enjoy, and then he quotes, we buy things we do not need to impress people we do not like. It's time we awaken to the fact that conformity to a sick society is to be sick. Sure, play with mammon. It will kill you. And to think, well, I can get Jesus and the mammon is to actually be sick. Because we actually think that having options brings us freedom. But it's paralyzing us. It's keeping us from going fully in on what God has for us. And so we hold back and we blame God and we blame a spouse or a divorce. And we blame our kids or the culture or the government. And all God is saying, listen, if you go all in with me, you're going to get everything you need. No matter who's in charge, no matter what she did or what he did or what they're doing, I want you all in with me. The problem for us is we are 80% in with the Lord and 20% in with mammon. And Jesus is saying, well, that's actually 100% in with mammon. February 19th, 1519, there's a Spanish explorer named Hernan Cortez. And he sets sail for Mexico with a small entourage of ships and horses and sailors and soldiers, and he wants to take over some, uh, some of the Aztec area in Mexico. The population there is about 5 million. So the odds of him winning any kind of battle is 7,541 to 1. And he and his men pull their 11 ships on shore, and he tells his men, we're going to go take this land. And the men are fearful about what's about to happen. They think about their families back home and what they have back home. And Cortez knows it. And so Cortez makes a statement that's now blown up into mythical proportions. And he turns to his men and he says, Then burn the ships. Light them on fire. Because what Cortez knew was as long as his men had a way out, they wouldn't give themselves fully to the battle ahead of them. 
Those ships for us is our mammon. And what the Lord has called us to do in Matthew 6 is to burn the ships. You're either all in with Jesus or you're all out. All this comes from the old ancient book, The Art of War, which reads, when your army has crossed the border, you should burn your boats and bridges in order to make it clear to everybody that you have no hankering after home. And following Jesus, I would say, when you've crossed the border of following him, you should burn your mammon in order to make it clear to everybody you have no hankering for that world again. You're either a citizen of the kingdom of heaven or you're a citizen of the kingdom of this world. And the longer we hold on to the mammon, whatever it looks like, we're missing out on what God has for us. And so for some of us, here's the call this morning. You need to be all in in your marriage because that high school girlfriend that you still talk to on Facebook is ruining your life. You need to be all in on your marriage. That girlfriend you had, that boyfriend, that side piece that you've got right now, you need to be all in on this thing. And when you are, that's seeking the kingdom of God. Parents, you need to be all in on your kids. Not you do 50, then the youth pastor and coaches do the other 50%. You do 100%. You're all in on them. These are my kids given to me by the grace of God. You'd be all in on parenting those sweet young souls and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. For some of us, it means we need to be all in on the church. Like you've held back enough and you put in your time, you do your attendance, you might even give money. But what the Lord is asking is, are you still holding some mammon back for the world? Are you spending all you have for his glory and the good of others? But I imagine for many of us, the mammon is keeping us from going all in with our relationship with the Lord. And as long as the ships are floating, you've always got an option. And it will always hold you back. I love options. Like, I love having other options and places to go. I love thinking through different ways to get different places on trips and where to sit in a restaurant to make sure I can get to another exit quicker. I love all of that. But it's cost me in my walk with Jesus. It wasn't until a handful of years ago I recognized I got to go all in on this thing. And I will tell you, in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all those things have been added to me. So it's the call this morning. You want to hold on to your mammon and your excuses about the way somebody treated you? You want to go all in on Jesus. You want to hold on to your mammon about these other religions and other faiths and other ways of thinking? Or is it time this morning to go all in, to burn the ships and go all in on Jesus? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I just want to... Give us a chance to respond this morning. I don't know what ships you have to burn today. But it's probably that thing that comes into your mind that you think, no, I couldn't do without that. Well, that's the one. That's the one. And this morning, the call of following Jesus is to count the cost, take up your cross, and to follow him. To deny yourself. And I just, I just don't want us to be a church of 80% in people. Don't want us to be entangled by the mammon of the world. So the invitation from Jesus is to give him all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Can we do it today? Because the anxiousness you're feeling is from trying to please the God of this world and please the king of the universe. You can't. You end up despising one. I don't know where you find yourself today, but to give your heart to Jesus is just simply a response to his good and perfect sacrifice on the cross. Not just to believe that he did it, but that to believe in it. To root your life around that being true. Some of us today, it's time to cut ties with the past. Time to cut ties in relationships. Time to cut ties at work time. Father, we are a people just prone to wanting choices. We'd rather have options than to have only you. So would you challenge us in those places? Give us a desire for you and for you alone, that we be a community of people who are seeking first the kingdom of God in a way that it shapes the way we see everything. 
that it shapes the way we see our wealth, the way it shapes the way we see our poverty, the way it shapes we see our marriages or our singleness, the way it shapes we see our kids or our infertility, the way it shapes all of that by seeking first the kingdom of God. So give us courage to burn the ships this morning in Jesus' name.